Great. I'm very happy to see some of you coming down to the front closer. It makes a cosy atmosphere. So that's really nice. It warms me up as well. So very nice to see everybody. Uh, the title of this retreat, as you know, is uh, Time to Love the Breath. And one of the most important words there is time, because we often don't give ourselves a lot of time between busy appointments, between getting on the train and getting off it and catching your connection, which I just managed to do yesterday. Um, but time has a much deeper meaning too. It's not only about uh, being in the present moment, uh, obviously that's an important part of practice, but it's also about understanding that the process of meditation takes time and we need to give it time. We need to give ourselves time, especially in the beginning to just settle in, settle into our bodies, settle into this room. Uh, because it's very new for us to collect together as a group and to check in whether we're feeling you know, well, whether we're feeling warm enough, whether we're, our bodies are comfortable. Can you hear me okay? Just? Okay. <laughs> whether my voice is loud enough. So all these things are part of that settling and, and it's important to give ourselves that time. So the main reason I picked this theme is probably quite uh, a personal reason because this is the way I practice. Um, for those who don't know me, I started the practice of Vipassana in around 1996. That was when I lived in India and I um, came to the practice through this very, quite a strict sort of method with a lot of discipline where we would be observing our body and our body sensations repeatedly for long days on end. Um, and developing a lot of mindfulness and clarity and awareness of what was going on inside this body-mind process. And I found that I developed very strong uh, mindfulness and equanimity and some understanding into things like impermanence and certainly suffering. <clears throat> and also to some extent the non-self aspect of uh, the Buddha's teachings. And yet something seemed to be slightly missing um, and I started sensing that there wasn't quite enough emphasis given to the calm, to calming the mind using breath meditation and also to developing metta, loving kindness. And these two aspects of the path, in a way, in that method, seemed a little bit on the outside, just preparations for the real practice. But what I realized later in my practice was that these two practices of breath meditation and of metta meditation are really fundamental in molding perception. And there's part of the Buddha's teachings, uh, which everybody knows, Sila, Samadhi and Panya, which is obviously the fundamental aspects of the path, the virtue, the calming of the mind and the wisdom. But the Buddha also framed the whole path, all of his teachings, as a training in perception. Yeah. So that's very interesting to me that the whole path can be seen as a training in perception. So it's not only being able to perceive impermanence or to be able to understand suffering, but it's having the flexibility of mind to be able to mold it, sort of train it, direct it in whatever direction feels beneficial to us at the time. So metta practice is a really powerful method of molding the mind. And obviously it's molding the mind in very wholesome, beautiful states. So here we're developing qualities such as warmth, acceptance, uh, benevolence, a sense of goodwill. And this is not only to others, but also to ourselves. And this kind of meta practice can be applied to so many aspects of our practice. It's not just a superfluous add on to the main method of Vipassana or the main method even of breath meditation, but it's actually part and parcel of the whole path. So from a big picture perspective, um, we could say that the path and the first factors of the noble path are to develop the mind in wholesome states. So to develop a sense of right perspective on life 
uh, to develop the qualities of virtue in our hearts. And I'll go to, into this in much more detail over the three days. Um, and to develop beautiful qualities so that we can calm the mind. Often one of the problems, I think, with calm meditation is we come from our busy lives, we sit down on our cushion and we kind of want the mind to go still. <laughs> I don't know. Do you expect that? Anyone expects that? <laughs> but actually what we find is, of course, there's a lot of reverberation from the way we've been using our mind and our body and usually pushing it far too hard. And so it's not possible to go from a very busy, stressful life straight into calm. But developing these beautiful qualities, loving kindness, uh, compassion, sympathetic joy, maybe reflecting on one's own generosity, on one's own goodness, help to kind of bridge your life from the outside world into the meditation. So we can use uh, these qualities to give some uplift to the mind and bring some joy to the mind so that when we sit to meditate, the mind can settle down. And of course, with this calm that we can develop, we're able more clearly to see into the nature of suffering, the causes of suffering, and of course, the way out. Yeah. As long as the mind's running around from object to object, from thought to thought, it's very hard to really see things as they are. You know, we might think that we're seeing things as they are, but we're not able to stay long enough with any one object to really penetrate its nature. So metta practice and also breath meditation are really powerful methods of calming the mind. They can be done separately. So the breath meditation was the Buddha's own favorite meditation, the one that he practiced under the Bodhi tree when he um, basically made a resolution not to move until he was fully enlightened. Um, so he was practicing breath meditation. But also the loving kindness is a meditation that can take you from the very beginning of the path all the way to the final goal. Because it also takes you through those stages of understanding, insight, and also calming the mind to see more deeply into things. So we can practice them separately, and we'll do a little bit of that during this retreat, but we can also practice them together. And I found in my own practice that when they're combined, um, either on, mostly on the cushion at this point, um, it becomes incredibly powerful. It's almost as if the metta is a kind of, um, what do you call it, like an antibiotic that can kind of kill any bugs that are there in the system. So instead of just going to the breath too soon and struggling with it because we're not quite comfortable or we don't have goodwill towards the breath, we can add that loving kindness and it starts to undermine those obstacles. Yeah, so we can actually receive the breath as though the breath were a friend. And I found this incredibly powerful in my own practice. So I'm hoping we can just get a little bit of a taste for that together here. And any of these practices that we discuss or that I introduce are entirely optional. They're also for you to play with and apply and adapt as you wish. Uh, some people might incline to practicing more of loving kindness over the next few days, or even if you're here for the day, we'll focus quite a lot on that. Some people might find that their minds are already pretty balanced and have that sense of warmth and friendliness, acceptance, and the mind easily receives the breath. So the whole purpose in my mind of sort of offering different tools, different techniques is so that you can make the practice your own, so that you can really custom fit this to the condition of your mind, you know, and that will change over time. So some people take metta as their main vehicle for their whole life of practice, but it doesn't mean they neglect breath meditation or wisdom practices. They just emphasize the metta. And some people take the anapana as their main practice. But if you don't practice a bit of metta along with that, then it tends to become quite brittle and dry. Yeah? And all of these practices in conjunction really help to develop the wisdom. Because when there is an appreciation of suffering, an appreciation of how all beings desire happiness, as the Buddha said, and recoil from pain, 
when we appreciate that in ourselves and in others, then we have the motivation to respond with compassion, to develop loving kindness as a way of relating to ourselves and to the world. So I'm going to be talking about the centrality of those two practices in the path and showing how it links up with the other factors as we go through the retreat. And also just emphasizing that we're not practicing these in a vacuum. You know, it's not that they are separate and unrelated to one another. So if you're practicing breath meditation correctly, you're also developing loving kindness. If you're developing loving kindness, then it's easier to receive the breath, etc. So this will hopefully become clear to you as we proceed. So the various roles of metta are, as I said, in a practice in and of itself. So some people do use the metta meditation to uh, form the basis, the foundation of their practice. And you can do this by developing metta to different kinds of beings. So for example, starting with a loved person or a benefactor, and then generating metta for somebody who maybe you don't have strong feelings towards, what's called the person that you perceive with neutrality, sort of a neutral person. And then by extending that loving kindness to people that maybe you don't like very much or that have caused you some problems in the past, and then extending that metta to the whole world. And in this way, the mind can become uh, very one-pointed it's as though the different categories of beings fall away and we just start to generate metta to beings in general. And from there, the mind can become very one-pointed. So we're probably not going to get that far in three days. Um, but just to give a perspective on how metta can be a practice of itself, in and of itself. And then obviously as a preparation for practice, especially breath meditation, so as I said, sometimes with the breath meditation, we might struggle and not be able to hold the breath very clearly in mind. And one of the reasons for that is that we haven't done the appropriate preparation. You know, we've come in with all our agitation, our um, troubles from the world, or just, you know, with a mind that's not used to, to watching the breath. Because the breath, I don't know about everybody here, but it's not a particularly exciting object, is it? I don't think. <laughs> and I struggled myself with that for many years. I found it much, much more interesting to scan the body and experience different sensations and what was going on in my body and mind. And to be with the breath was a little bit boring. Um, something like some, a stage to get through so I could go on to something else. <laughs> but then when I started practicing metta before going to the breath, I found that it helped to overcome those coarser hindrances in the mind. So that sort of restlessness, that boredom, um, the jumping from one object to the other. Uh, the metta softened those coarser hindrances and also gave a sense of joy to the mind. So metta has this beautiful quality of happiness associated with it, which is incredibly helpful in the breath meditation particularly when you get to a certain point and according to the instructions, we're supposed to start experiencing joy with the breath. So in a sense, practicing metta before we even get into the breath gives you a kind of head start. You already have a sense of softness and ease. It might not be like bliss coursing through your body, but it's a sense of, ah, just coming into this moment with acceptance, with a sense of softness, and the mind becomes receptive to the breath. So when the breath comes in, it's easy to hold. Yeah. So I think one of the troubles with breath meditation is we go to the object too soon. And also when the mind's not really receptive enough, soft enough, at ease enough to receive that breath. We often talk about, you know, going to the breath and holding the breath. But when you have metta in the mind, you don't need to hold that breath. It's just as though like a little, I don't know, child or a little bird would come to you. And, you know, if you're very frightening and kind of want to grab that child or grab that little bird, it's going to run away, right? But if you're a very safe and gentle presence to a child or an animal, then that child, that animal will come close. 
And it's very similar with this delicate object of the breath. It gets kind of scared if you think, if it thinks that you're going to kind of grab it and force it to stay. Uh, because the breath is very subtle and it gets increasingly subtle as we practice. But if we have this very uh, warm and loving, accepting mind, okay, breath, if you want to come, that's fine. If you want to go, that's fine too. <laughs> have you ever tried that, that kind of meditation? Letting the breath come in, but letting it go as well. Ah, oh, it's so nice. The breath's not scared of you. And, you know, in the meantime, you can just wait there patiently, giving things time, being a friendly presence, and just wait until that breath wants to come back to you. So often people go too soon, and that's why there's this kind of tug of war with the breath. So my advice for these days is to just focus on developing that the mind as a kind of loving container or receptacle for the breath. So if you find the breath's not coming naturally or it's not staying with you for very long, then just not even go back because there's no stages you have to achieve, but just continue to cultivate wholesome states. Yeah. And this is another lovely aspect of metta, that metta is a kind of unconditional giving. It's, you know, this aspect of unconditionality with loving kindness, that you're going to be loving and caring no matter what, without expecting anything in return. So metta is very related to giving rather than getting. So we're not trying to get some stages in meditation. We're much more focused on what we can give, how we can cultivate a beautiful quality of mind and just give ourselves to the moment, give ourselves to the breath. Yeah? And I think this is very beautiful because for me as a person who really enjoys giving and who feels, often puts others before myself, um, there's sometimes more motivation to engage in a practice whereby I feel I can give, you know, because I know that metta has power and metta has a real effect. So when I'm practicing with the thought of other beings in mind or just with the thought of developing qualities that will, you know, help other beings in this world, then there's a lovely pure motivation to the practice. And whether I benefit or not, whether I gain so-called states of samadhi or enlightenment or not is less important than the qualities that I'm cultivating yeah, and the way that I'm learning to give. So the other lovely aspect of metta, and there's a lot, <laughs> is that it develops a familiarity with the emotional states of samadhi because states of deep meditation are very much emotional states. They're not, again, things that we achieve, but they're more like uh, states that arise when we let go of the obstacles to them. So the whole practice is aimed at taking away those hindrances, the Buddha said, that obscure wisdom and that basically prevent the mind from unifying in those deep states of samadhi. So we're trying to clear out, clear away obstacles on the path. Just as if you were in a jungle somewhere, I don't know about in Sheffield, maybe there's some kind of woody, jungly parts, maybe not jungle. But if you were walking through the forest and there were lots of prickly plants, you'd try to clear them away so that you don't trip up on the prickles or, you know, step over something and, and fall on your face. So you try to clear them away so you don't uh, trip on the roots of delusion or the roots of wanting or aversion. So we're trying to clear a path through this jungle of our mind. And uh, metta is really powerful in helping that. And one of the most uh, tricky of those hindrances is ill will. Yeah. It doesn't have to be outright hate or animosity towards another person, but just that sense of being not quite content you know, always wanting something more or never quite being satisfied with what we have right now. So that sense of, you know, the breath not being interesting enough or um, important enough to give time to. You know, the ill will that's maybe towards ourselves. 
You know, this is one of the most difficult hindrances to overcome and it can be very subtle. Again, it might not manifest as, you know, hatred of ourselves or dislike of ourselves, although that can be there. But sometimes it can manifest as um, not quite allowing ourselves to experience the joy of the present moment, you know, or not feeling that that joy is quite enough. Yeah. And this is a real obstacle for people, especially when, you know, we do go into the stages of joy with the breath. Sometimes it's there, but we're just not able to receive it. We're looking for something else. Or sometimes it's very strong. You know, it's almost as though it starts to engulf us and carry us away in a sort of blanket of peace. And we feel like, no, no, I don't deserve it. You know, this is not good. This is not for me. I need to work harder first, you know, or maybe there's remorse about your conduct, the things you've done in your life that you wish you hadn't. <laughs> so we have this kind of sense of ill will of not being quite good enough to receive the joy that's available. If only we can just stay and wait and allow it in. So metta overcomes all this and it's obviously a very important part of practice is to learn to give. You know, it's in a sense the whole thrust of the path is to learn to just give away our self-interest, our selfishness, give away our craving, our ill will, you know, give away our wanting, our endless kind of lack of satisfaction um, and really go in a different direction, to go against the stream. So I don't want to talk for too much longer because it's important that we get into some practice. But uh, just a couple more similes that I really like. And um, one is something that my own teacher, Ajahn Brahm, has offered, uh, which is the aspect of a mind that is soft. And I think this is a very beautiful idea that there can be such a thing as a soft mind. So the mind can get very hard and brittle when we're kind of busy in the world and when there's fear or anxiety or stress. And at that time, it's very hard even for friends to approach us and, you know, and to try and say some kind words or, you know, bring a smile on our face because the mind's just very hard. It's reactive. It's brittle. It doesn't have much capacity or resilience anymore. But there's also something called a soft mind. And that's the mind that's more like a sponge. It's been softened up with things like loving kindness or sympathetic joy. And then the mind becomes very receptive. So a hard mind is like something made of concrete. You know, there might be a breath there, but the breath just can't find a way in to your mind. It just bounces off that concrete and goes right out again. But the soft mind is like a sponge. So it absorbs, it soaks in the breath and you know, the breath can expand that mind so much that it becomes very um, wide and very um, vast. And the Buddha talked about states of samadhi as being like mahagata, the mind gone to greatness. So the mind that is boundless, the mind that is wide, resilient, able to accept that joy, able to accept so many things that might happen to us in our lives. So I like this idea of a soft mind. And this is all part of molding that mind to be a friend, to be of benefit to us with these beautiful qualities so we can really use the mind for something worthwhile. And then the Buddha himself had a, another simile, which was that the mind, uh, when it's purified from the five hindrances, is like melted gold. So you can imagine the mind when it's hard, when it's full of agitation or ill will. It's kind of like this very uh, solid lump of gold, but that gold has a lot of impurities in it, like tin or metal or brass. And in ancient India, they used to melt down the gold to remove those impurities. So it was molten and then they could put it to work. So the Buddha said that a melted a, a mind that is soft is like a mind, like melted gold. You can put it to anything you want to. You can make use of it. It's fit for work. And it's also unbiased. It's an unbiased mind that is not um, 
repelled by what it sees. It doesn't have vested interests in what it sees, but rather it's open and receptive. And this is like the mind when it's free from hindrances. After states of deep samadhi in particular, we can see things as they are. The mind is so resilient, so soft and so energized as well. Um, and also very happy that we can see truths like the truth of suffering or the truth of non-self without being repelled, without thinking, no, no, that can't be the case. I don't want to see that. But while, rather we're receptive and able to penetrate those truths. So I would like to practice with using kindness in the way we observe the body, first of all, today just to help us settle in before we go to the breath and before we practice metta to sort of bring it up more, more richly in our minds. Um, because the body is something that we can be aware of fairly easily. And it's quite easy to practice the attitude of kindness with the body because we can know whether we're being kind or not by the result. So, for example, when you have maybe an ache or a pain in the body, maybe in your knee, maybe you already have one, <laughs> or in your back, um, you can just feel sometimes how the mind will tighten up around it and resist that pain. And sometimes when we resist it or, you know, when we don't want it, it actually gets stronger and more of a problem because our mind is just focusing on the discomfort and is unable to see anything else. But when we have the same pain and we actually relate to that pain with kindness, with a sense of maybe curiosity or interest, and we're able to just stay steady with that, then we can start to feel sometimes that those pains, those aches start to loosen up, the body relaxes even with the tiredness or the agitation or the, the aches and the pains. And when I'm saying this, I mean, I think it's important to differentiate between pain in the body that's physically uh, dangerous. So if you do have an old injury or something like that, and it's going to exacerbate that problem by sitting in a certain posture, then please change your posture. That's also kindness to the body. But there are some kind of sensations in the body that um, are just increased by, you know, our ill will or by the aversion that we bring to them. And I actually had such pains in my body last night. I don't exactly know what it was, whether I'd not gone to the toilet or something. I hope you don't mind me just mm. speaking honestly about the body because <laughs> I've lived in India for many years. But um, certainly there was some blockage and I woke up in the night and it was quite strong. It almost feel like it went right through my torso. And I thought, oh, well, this is a really good opportunity to practice what I'm going to preach. <laughs> so the first thing I did was to really let go into the bed. Like notice if there was some tightening or tension in the body and just really let go. Just say, OK, this bed is just holding me here. So I don't know, it's not quite as nice as a bed, but maybe your cushion can kind of substitute the bed in that case. <laughs> uh, so just really relax into where I was and, and, you know, not allow the mind to kind of hold on too much. And then the next thing was to do a kind of little body scan and really see if I could pervade the body with a sense of kindness. So I was suffusing all the different sensations right through from the back to the front with this sense of warmth and kindness and care. You know, again, maybe the way that you'd give a small child a big hug, you know, sort of seeing my own body like this thing that's hurting and I'm not really sure why, but obviously it just needs a bit of tender care. So I was really softening into it rather than resisting it and almost sort of a sense of expanding the sense of the body and just relaxing into the bed. And I did manage to get some more sleep, thank goodness. So I'm not only running on coffee this morning, <laughs> but also some good rest. And uh, in that sense, the body is a really good way. It's a good vehicle to practice this uh, loving attention toward. So my own teacher, Ajahn Brahm, who some of you may know, um, he's a very, 
I guess, well-known monk now uh, of almost 50 years. Uh, and he was born in England, but lives, lived a long time in Thailand. And now he's in Perth in Australia. And uh, he's quite imaginative and inventive in his way of uh, describing the path. And uh, he coined this beautiful word, kindfulness, which I think is a wonderful um, improvement to the word mindfulness. Because as I say, you know, sometimes you need that antivirus along with the mindfulness to sort of zap some of those hindrances as you actually apply your awareness to what arises in front of you. So it's kindness plus mindfulness. And he likens that to mindfulness being like the light of the sun. So it sort of illuminates whatever is in front of it. You know, so we know what's going on. But then the sun also has this warmth with it. And that is the kindness that we add. And when these two things flow together, then it's really strong mindfulness. It's the mindfulness that the Buddha intended it to be. Because if you look at the Noble Eightfold Path, right attitude or right intention, in other words, the right way of relating, comes before right mindfulness. And the Eightfold Path is supposed to be, to some extent, sequential. So one thing leads into the next and strengthens the next factor along the way. But also these factors work together so that if you really have right mindfulness, it includes kindness, it includes a sense of gentleness, a sense of patience, letting things be. Yeah. So by adding this kindness to the way that we're aware, we're learning to relate not only to our bodies and to um, our breath, in a skillful way, but it also helps infuse, well, helps with a good disposition towards everything uh, we encounter in life. Yeah. So metta is not only sort of may all beings be happy, and it's not only a mood, it's not only an emotion, but it's also a disposition, a way we regard the world. So are we ready to mold our mind a little bit in the direction of loving kindness. And if you are comfortable lying down here at the front, please continue. I'm really happy to see people are easy enough to do what they need. So this is not a strict monastery or a Zen meditation retreat where I wield a stick. So <laughs> you can point your feet at me. I don't mind. You can lie right across here. Um, you're going to be having a lunch break where you I'm going to encourage lying down meditation, so you might as well start to practice it now. <laughs> Yay. So we'll sit for about 40 minutes or lie down. So really take some time in the beginning to ask your body what it needs right now. And really take your time. There's no rush. Loosening any clothing, perhaps, or pulling your blanket more closely around you. And just noticing as the room becomes quiet, and with your eyes closed. You start to sense into your body.
perhaps first of all into your posture. To just check that you're really comfortable enough. So just checking that your limbs are not pressing into one another. Sometimes the knees can be folded a little too tightly. You might want to loosen them up. Or if you're on a chair, check the position of your feet under the knees. Is it more comfortable to put them slightly forward from the knees? Checking the distribution of weight between your thighs and your buttocks. Maybe rocking slightly from side to side if you're sitting down. And checking your spine, up your spine, to see if your spine would benefit from gentle, a gentle stretch. Or maybe if you're on a chair from leaning back. I usually now roll my shoulders a bit. They tend to be quite scrunchy. So just giving them the opportunity to loosen up. And that can change the position of the hands in the lap or on the thighs. Checking in with your hands, how they feel most comfortable and at ease. And then going to your neck. My neck's a little bit stiff from standing up on a train. Maybe from working on the computer too much. So I just like to stretch my neck. Look up and down from side to side without opening my eyes. And then allowing the head to rest comfortably on the neck. Sensing the space above the top of the head. So the body is upright and yet can relax. Sensing the ground below you holding you. The bones providing the frame of the body, the structure, the support for all the muscles and flesh. So you can really allow those muscles, allow the flesh, the skin to melt down into the ground. Held by the skeleton, held by the ground.
and sensing this space that we share as a warm and friendly space where people who are like-minded have come together to develop on the path. All of us bringing with us the beautiful intention to give ourselves the gift of time. Just time for ourselves, time to be kind. And real kindness just gives without expecting anything in return. Being kind just for the sake of being kind. Giving just for the sake of giving, giving ourselves to this moment in time. Maybe taking a couple of deep breaths to imbibe the kindness, the stillness, the atmosphere and relax more fully as you breathe out. Settling more deeply into your body, into your cushion or the floor. and relaxing the breath to become natural. As we move our attention to the top of the head, so we're just going to go through the body, experiencing the sensations that are available to us, whatever they may be. and making that mindfulness a vehicle for our kindness. As though mindfulness were the light of the sun and kindness were the warmth. So experiencing any sensations that you notice on the top of your head and allowing this kindfulness, kind awareness to gently, naturally spread to every part of the top of your head. If it helps, you could even imagine that the sun is shining on your head and you're just basking in the warmth and the soft light of that sun. Allowing any sensations to become present and to open up. Relaxing your forehead, experiencing any tightness or tension, perhaps in the brow. And just notice, is there anything you can let go of?
anything you know no, no longer need to hold. Checking your temples, eyelids, cheeks, nose, mouth. Receiving any sensations and treating them with kindness and care. Allowing the jaw to relax. Taking off that mask that we sometimes present to the world. Now no one's looking at you. You don't have to be anyone or anything at all. Experiencing any sensations in the neck, around the back of the head and the neck, perhaps even developing a sense of gratitude to the muscles in the neck for supporting your head. And this kind awareness keeps on flowing down through the shoulders into any knots or areas of tightness or tension. Not seeking to push away any experience, but simply to be kind. So that your mindfulness is like the light of the sun, the kindness is like the warmth, and you're just basking, relaxing in that friendly presence of the mind, the sunshine of kindfulness. As it spreads down the arms, into the elbows, all around the lower arm, in your own time. Relaxing the whole arm from the shoulder, down through the elbow to the hands, the palms, the fingers and the fingertips. Noticing all the sensations, maybe tingling, maybe coolness or warmth, whatever you notice, just care for that sensation by receiving it with a, a sense of friendliness and warmth. Moving 
up to the top of the chest. Spreading this golden sunshine through the chest. Through the rib cavity. Into the trunk where you have your heart, your lungs. Just feeling into any sensation you experience in the chest, in the trunk. And allowing those feelings, those sensations to relax. If there are any areas of tightness or pain, see if you can give them just a very gentle mental massage by gently spreading your attention out from that area, keeping it very soft. and spreading this kindfulness all the way down to the abdomen, around the sides of the body. And across the back. So the whole torso is bathing basking in the sunshine of kindfulness. Perhaps spending a little longer on any areas that don't have sensations or feel maybe some tightness. Seeing if you can relax. Relax with that tightness or tension. And notice how that helps to loosen things up. Noticing any sensations in your hips, your buttocks. Places that bear so much weight.
receiving those sensations without judgment, without ill will, just kindly letting them be. Curious to get to know them. And you may find this kindfulness just spreads naturally down the thighs. Perhaps penetrating deep into the tissues, the muscles, into the bone. Allowing all the muscles of the thighs to relax. Noticing the sensations in your knees, behind the knees. With gratitude for all that your legs, your thighs, your knees, your feet do for you. Now it's their chance to relax. This kindfulness moves right down the shins and the calves, the feet, the soles, the toes. So no part of your body is left out. The whole body is just basking in the friendly presence of your mind. feeling valued, feeling cared for.
And when the whole body has been bathed in this kindfulness, this unconditional awareness, then just get a sense of the body as a whole. <clears throat> you might not experience every part of the body, but just a sense of the whole body now relaxing in the warmth and the light of the sun. And see if there's anything else you can let go of. If there are any areas of tightness or tension that you are still tensing up around, What is that attitude of mind that can let go? Give things space. Allow them, allow all sensations just to be. Allowing yourself to more and more deeply relax. Perhaps as if you were lying in a, a beautiful turquoise lagoon full of clean, warm water, if you like water. No pressure anywhere on the body. No need to hold.
we're coming close to the end of the meditation now. Before we end, I'd like to invite you to just bring up a few phrases of loving kindness towards your body and mind. Thanking your body for all that it does, enabling you to be here today. You may not be in perfect health, but your body is allowing you to sit or to lie down and practice meditation. So may I be grateful for my body. May I be kind. May my body be a vehicle for goodness in this world. May my body be safe, cared for, relaxed and at ease. And may I treat my body with kindness. <laughs> so once again, sensing into your body Perhaps moving your attention from the head to the toes, just to get a sense of the body sitting or lying. And notice if the body has become a little more relaxed. Reflecting what were the causes that led to that softening, that relaxation. Or perhaps what were the causes of not becoming relaxed? How did it feel to be kind to your body and your mind? So just ending the meditation by taking a few deep breaths. And I'll ring the gong. You can listen to the sound of the gong and come out on the third ringing of the gong.
Ah. Oh. Sometimes when we sit, especially the first day, we realize how tired we are. <laughs> and that's totally normal at the beginning of a retreat. Ah. So I'm glad to see some of you lying down and looking relaxed. Is everyone warm enough? No? Oh, okay. We'll find you some more blankets, hopefully. Anyone else still cold? Yeah, okay. Three or four of you. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's hot drink time, so that might help. So now, according to the schedule, is a period of walking meditation. Please do take hot drinks if you need to warm up. Um, and for this first session, I would just suggest practicing in whatever way feels supportive for you. Uh, once again, you might want to just see how it feels to bring that little bit more kindness in the way you experience any sensations in your feet. So rather than just being aware of the sensations as your feet lift up and touch the floor, also see if you can have that sense of curiosity and kindness as if you're receiving these sensations for the first time and you really care to know how your feet are doing. Yeah. So is there anyone here who hasn't done walking meditation before? Yeah, okay. So fortunately you're in a group of people who will all look as strange as you. Because <laughs> uh, we tend to do it indoors because it can look a little bit strange to do it in the street. Although it has been done. <laughs> so the idea is to find uh, a place where you can walk back and forth. So there's a beginning and an end. Um, I'm not sure if you're doing that upstairs on the room second. One upstairs. Oh, right. Brilliant. So there's a whole room, room one, and there'll be probably a long side and a shorter side. And since we're 40 or so people, please take the shorter width. And you basically start by standing and just getting into your body the same way you experience the body when you're sitting down. So just having a sense of the body standing, feeling into the sensations, perhaps particularly in the feet, the legs. And then when you're ready, you just mindfully lift up one foot and place it down. But you'll notice you can practice with your hand if you want. I mean, I practice like on my knee. <laughs> you can just lift up your foot. And then notice how it feels when it touches the ground. So just get into the sensations there. It's as if your mind is inside your foot. And then you gently move the foot forward, feel the weight change from the back to the front of the foot. And then that foot lifts, moves. You feel the sensations as it moves through the air and then back down again. I think the other foot should have come in maybe already. <laughs> so you're basically moving one foot at a time, more or less. And I would suggest in the beginning, don't go too unnaturally slowly. I mean, obviously you can't go very fast if the room's short, but just try and keep it kind of natural and just with a general sense of curiosity around what you're experiencing in your feet. Yeah, so it's very, very similar to the way we practice meditation sitting, only there's a little bit more activity, so it can be helpful to, uh, to give the mind something to do, something to really, uh, keep its interest and sustain that interest. So it's a little bit of active meditation. And it's a great kind of bridge between the sitting meditation and any other activity that you'll be doing. So, you know, the whole day is yours to practice. So it helps to just keep the mind kind of within itself. So you're not sending your mind off in different directions. You're not looking at the other people in the room. You're just keeping your eyes down and focusing pretty much on your feet. If you find that's a little bit too restrictive, you can focus on all the moving parts of the body, so the whole leg. So just see whatever your mind wants to do and keep that attitude of kindness. So that means a soft mind, a receptive mind, you know, a little bit of care and warmth. So you don't force yourself to keep going if your mind's had enough. Um, you can sit down and relax. And I think at 12 o'clock, there'll be the lunch bell. So uh, 
be interesting to see what your mind does around 10 to or 5 to 12. Mm -hmm. <laughs> see if you're still with your feet or if your feet start kind of suddenly moving somewhere towards the kitchen door <laughs> or your mind starts going there first. So, and uh, we have quite a long lunch period because two reasons really. I like to give people a lot of time to just relax and you know you can come in here and practice on your own you can lie down and have a rest um, you can do drinking tea meditation you can do eating meditation <laughs> whatever you want so uh, and also for the people on zoom so that they have enough time to prepare their meal um, and then we'll meet back in here at about 1.30 uh, for some more Dhamma reflections on loving kindness we did some proper loving kindness and uh, some more guided meditation so this is really your time but see if you can make use of uh, yeah most of the next half hour for your walking because it can be a really lovely way to calm the mind so see how it goes great And if anyone wants to cuddle a bear at any point, this is the purpose of the bear. It's a very nice bear from Western Australia with an indigenous name. He's called uh, Jerapin, which means happiness. So if anyone needs a bit of a, a happiness boost, but please return him here before 1.30. <laughs>